Let's get right into the word. We're starting a new series this month strategically on the garden of God. And I, I'm going to teach this morning, we're going to kind of slow it down and give a foundational message. And I'm, I'm going to show you how your garden is a heart and how all throughout the Bible that God prepares you for the planting of his word in your life to transform and to change you. And I'm going to show you throughout this series how whenever God waters something, everything is watered in the garden. That means weeds are watered and seeds are watered. And it's up to us to uproot and to pull out the things that would choke out the life-giving seed that God intends for us to have. And so all throughout this series, we're going we're gonna to visit the Garden of Eden. We're going to visit the Garden of Gethsemane. We're going to end uh, on Easter Sunday in the Garden Tomb and we're going to find out how and why that, that Mary looked up and she supposed that Jesus was the gardener. There's a reason for that. And so stay with us this entire month. Don't miss one Sunday and continue to invite as many people with you leading into Easter Sunday. Because I believe this Easter Sunday will be the greatest soul winning day that we've ever experienced here at Gulf Coast. Do you believe that with me? Amen. And we don't have to wait until Easter to see that happen. It can happen today. It can happen next week. Believe in God to do all of it. And so let's get right into the word um, here today. The series is the God of the Garden. And if you're taking notes, it won't be on the screen. Uh, today I just want to talk about the heart garden, on how your heart is, in fact, a garden. Gardens reveal throughout Scripture the love of God. The beauty of the garden reveals a loving designer, but the bounty of a garden reveals a loving provider. The gardens all throughout the Bible play a, a significant and an important role in the gospel story. Gardens show us several things, like the Garden of Eden uh, brought sin into the world, and the, 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 the Garden of Gethsemane showed us that Jesus was betrayed there. And so throughout gardens, we see how to deal with sin. We see how to deal with betrayal. But Jesus was also buried and resurrected in a garden tomb, showing us that the garden has a way of fighting through all of the minutia of life and getting us from death over into the life category. So gardens play a significant role in the gospel. The Garden of Eden shows us about sin. The Garden of Gethsemane shows us about crushing. The garden tomb shows us that we can come out of whatever situation that we're in, but the gospel can be found in the intricate details of the garden topic throughout Scripture. Gardens are interwoven throughout biblical history to ensure that we know that God reversed every curse brought onto us by sin through the blood of Jesus Christ. I want you to know this. Every single curse that the enemy brought onto us and was opened in a garden, Jesus went to a garden tomb to reverse every curse on our lives. It's awesome. Somebody said, well, pastor, what does that mean? Well, look back just for a moment. I'm just going to give you kind of an introduction into this entire month. But, but man stole from a tree, from the fruit of the tree, man stole and exchanged sin for the pleasures of the garden and our life. And Jesus comes along and the Bible says he dies on a tree. To reverse the curse of the enemy that we stole from the tree, Jesus came to give us back life while hanging and dying on a tree. God puts Jesus on to the tree to reverse what was done in the beginning. His hands were pierced. This is just an intro. His hands were pierced. Why? Because we stole from the tree. His feet were pierced because the first messianic prophecy of Jesus involved crushing the head of the serpent. And so all of this revelation is locked and found in a garden, and we must go through the door of revelation to find out how God says our heart is a garden. Now, 
Jeremiah 31 is where we're going to lift our text today. It's in the Old Testament. I encourage you, one of the major prophets, Jeremiah 31, the weeping prophet, uh, your heart, Jeremiah says, is a garden. Jeremiah 31 and 12, therefore, the Bible says, they shall come and sing in the height of Zion. They shall flow together in the goodness of God for weed and for wine and for oil and for the young flock and for the herd. And their soul, that word soul means heart in the Hebrew, and their soul and their heart shall be as a watered garden, and they shall not sorrow any more at all. And so Jeremiah is saying prophetically that I see a day when a Savior is going to come. I see a day when the oil of the anointing that was released from the cross of Calvary is going to shatter every curse that the enemy placed on our lives and to reveal to us that if we believe in our hearts and confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus, that every seed that he has designed for our lives will take up residence and bring forth a harvest for our future. And so Jeremiah sees all of this unfolding and he literally says the seed of God's word planted in the soil of our hearts will begin to swell and push out everything in its way. Even as a seed in an earthly garden uh, pushes through dirt and rocks and weeds, it is powerful, but, but in order for the seed to grow in our hearts, it must be planted. Now, by a show of hands, how many are ready for the planting of the word of God in your heart? When you allow the word of God to be planted in your heart, it changes and rearranges what comes out of your mouth. We must learn to deal with the issues of the heart for out of the abundance of the heart, what does the Bible say? Your mouth begins to speak. Out of the abundance of your garden, you're going to see what is hidden there. A man's heart the Bible says, devises his ways, but the Lord directs his steps. <laughs> that's, that's not a popular passage because we have a lot of preachers saying, just follow your heart. But the word of God says, your heart is wicked. You cannot know it. So if you follow that heart, you will be led astray from the presence of of the Lord. But the Bible says that if you allow the Lord to direct your steps, steps, then the heart of the fathers will go back to the children and the children's heart will go back to the fathers in the last days. Our heart is a garden. The book of Deuteronomy is, is where I'm going to stay today. And, and I'm going to kind of jump in and out a little bit, but predominantly I'm going to stay in Deuteronomy because Deuteronomy is a, it, it's a pilgrimage passage. It, it's it's a passage about the, the children of Israel and God's chosen people coming out and, and going in and instructions on how to maintain the promise that God has for us. We see this in Deuteronomy 6, verses 5 and 8. God says, love the Lord your God with all of your, on the count of three, somebody shout heart. One, two, three. Love God. With all of your heart, love God with all of your soul, love God with all of your might. And these words, these seeds planted in your garden, which I command you this day, shall remain in your garden. Water them with faith. Teach them to your children. Talk about them when you sit down in your home, when you walk along the way, when you lie down, when you get up, when you eat pizza. Hello. When you bind them about a sign upon your hand that they shall be on the frontals of your eyelids. In other words, the scripture says, whatever is in your heart will show up in your life. Whatever is in your heart, hear this, parents, will show up in your children's lives. Whatever is in your heart will show up by what you put your hands to, whatever's in your heart will show you what you are glued to with your eyes. The epicenter of the conversation about a heart is found in Deuteronomy chapter 15. Deuteronomy, the, 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 the book that is titled The Pilgrim's Progress, it's about walking with God. It's about 
wondering with God. It's about working with God. It's about warring with the enemy, witnessing for the kingdom, and worshiping. It's a handbook for pilgrims. It's a roadmap for the wilderness in this world. And by the way, in your Bible, the wilderness is also a garden. It is the progress of life that we must deal with the issues of our hearts. So are you ready? Let's start right out of the gate. I'm at point number one. Who's ready? Say yes. yes. Here we go. Number one, dealing with a greedy heart. Pastor, you could have started out like a little more inviting. You could have started out like Pastor David did last week with just a beautiful story about a passage about a man who wrote and a tragedy and how God, you could have just, you could have opened up a little better than this, but you called us greedy. No, I said the enemy wants you to have a greedy heart, but God wants you to have a gracious heart. The Bible says in Deuteronomy 15 that we must deal with a greedy heart. Heart. Deuteronomy 15. If there be any, if there be among you a poor man or one of his brothers within the gates and the land which the Lord God gives you, it says, Do not harden your heart nor shut your hand from thy brother, but open your hand unto him, and thou shalt surely and willingly lend him sufficient for his need. And that which he wants. Beware, verse 9, that there not be a thought, here it is, in your wicked heart, saying, the seventh year, the year of release is at hand, and that I being evil against thy poor brother, and thou givest him naught, and he cried to the Lord against you, and it will be a sin to you. What is God talking about? Beware of what's in your wicked heart and this seventh year. What's this terminology talking about? You have to understand that this passage is saying that if you're walking along the way and you see someone that has a great need, don't begin to calculate if I give them something from my life, then I'm going to get it back in seven years. He says don't begin to calculate how you're going to get it back or count down the time from which it left your life to which it returns to your life. He he says God implemented this, this, this ecosystem or this economic system where God canceled all debts every seven years. How many would like that for your life? Hello, somebody. Well, we're going to give you Dave Ramsey in this place, and so we're going to wipe out all debt so you don't have to worry about it. But until then, Israel, God developed this this system for Israel that every seven years all debts were canceled, and it was called the year of Jubilee. And with all these debts being canceled in Israel, money was loaned with the understanding that every seventh year, all debts would be canceled. So there was no long-term debt in this sense. Money could never be borrowed or owed more than six years. So God was saying to the person that reaches out and identifies there's a need, he says, do not give and calculate when it's going to come back to you. Don't give and say, well, I'll go ahead and give this now because from four years from now, I'm going to get all this money back anyway because all debts are canceled. He was saying no. He said you can't look at giving that way because if you look at giving that way, you are taking ownership of what God has given you. It doesn't belong to you. It it belongs to God, and God is using you to give it, but it all belongs to him in the first place. Are you with me? Giving more than anything else in the Bible, we do as believers, works out selfishness and greed out of our lives. Now, I'm not just talking about money today. That is an element, but I'm talking about when you give joy, when you give grace, when you sow freedom in someone's life. How do you sow freedom? You tell them that they can be free. Hello. How do you sow grace in someone's life? You let them off the hook. How do you forgive somebody the same way that God forgive you? Should we forgive others? How do you bless somebody? You give them a second chance because God gave you a hundred chances. Hello, somebody in the room today. We were born selfish, but we are born again generous. I'm going to say that again. We were born selfish. If you have children, if you've had grandchildren, if you have any child around your life, you know you don't have to teach a child to be selfish. 
This morning, my children were playing Monopoly, and they were fighting over which piece they were going to use. Are you going to be the car, or are you going to be the thimble? Which one are you going to be? And they were playing Monopoly. Why? Because we believe at 7 a.m. to work on real estate at my house. I don't know why. And so we were, we were talking about how to build our portfolio and how to, how to raise up insight on real estate. And so we're going through this, and they were arguing, and they were being selfish on, well, I want this property, and I want this property. And so, and so my, the thought occurred to me, I didn't do it because I love my wife, but the thought occurred to me to be like Jesus and come in and flip the tables of the game. But I didn't do it because I love my wife, and she would have said, Josh, that is not kind. Don't do that to our children. But I said, Jesus flipped tables so I can flip a Monopoly game. Hello, somebody. <laughs> we were born selfish, but we are born again generous. We don't give just to get. We don't allow something to come into our lives just to always have it. In fact, God wants us to give, God wants to give to us so that he can give through us. Whenever God gives glory to us, he doesn't ask for his glory back. Why? Because God is saying there's more where that came from. Whenever God pours out his spirit in your life, he doesn't say, well, I'm going to take some of that back. You, you didn't use all of it. No. He says, I'm going to give it all to you because there's more where that came from. Whenever God heals us. He doesn't pull some of his healing back because we've gone through a rough patch. No, he releases healing in our lives, and he says there's plenty more where that came from. All you have to do is ask. Whenever God does something in your life, the cross testifies it is finished, meaning what he gave you is complete, and it will continue to be complete when you give it away. Somebody say amen to that. We are born selfish, but we are born again generous. Generosity separates us from the world as believers. Generosity works out the selfishness and entitlement from our lives. Contentment is the thing that overtakes greed in the garden of our hearts. If we battle greed with contentment, with gratitude, with giving, by delighting ourselves in Christ, we will gain something more lasting than anything the world can provide, a peace that passes all understanding. I'm teaching up in this place today. I don't know if you are here or not. We must deal with a selfish heart, but two is going to get better. But we must deal with a grieving heart, a grieving heart. Have you ever purchased something and walked out of where you purchased it or, or, or whether it was online or, or in a local store and you had buyer's remorse? Hello. We must deal with a grieving heart. Whenever you purchase something and you have buyer's remorse, your heart begins grieving over something else you could have purchased or the reality that you probably didn't need to buy that in the first place. So dealing with a grieving heart is something that we must address before we begin allowing God to till up the fertile soil of our hearts. Deuteronomy 15, I'm still in Deuteronomy. Beware, verse 9, that there not be a thought... In your wicked heart, I'm going back, saying the seventh year of the year of release is at hand. If your eye be evil against your brother, give him naught, and he cry to the Lord against you, it be a sin to you. Verse 10, this is something new. You shall surely give to him, and your heart shall not be grieved when you give it. Your heart shall not be grieved when you give it, because for this thing the Lord God blessed you in all of your works and in all that you put your hand to. Watch this now. Selfishness attacks you before you give and grief attacks you after you give. I'm going to say that again. Selfishness attacks you before you give and grief attacks you after you give. When you give, I want you to understand something, it does not belong to you. You are saying there is someone out there bigger than me that gave me this, and I am stewarding this thing along my life's journey. We own nothing. He owns everything. We are the stewards of what God has blessed us with in this earth. Somebody say amen to that. And so it doesn't belong to you, but it does come to you to go 
through you because God wants to give to us so he can give through us. The Bible says freely we have received, so freely we should what? Give. If we give something like love and hope and grace and forgiveness or even money and we are grieved when it leaves our lives, then at some point we bought into the reality that it belonged to us. Nothing belongs to you. It all belongs to your Father. If it grieves us when it leaves us, then we have made ourselves the source instead of the resource. If it grieves us, when it leaves us, then we somehow along the way believe the reality or the, or, or the dysfunction that it belonged to us in the first place. It all belongs to God, all of it. Pride says, I'm the one who gives grace because if I give the grace, then they should respond how I think they need to respond. How many have ever forgiven somebody? and they didn't respond how you thought, and you regretted forgiving them. Oh, we're not going to be real in the room today. Okay. Okay. All right. How many of you have given grace to somebody, and they turned around and did the same thing two and three more times, and you're like, why did I give grace in the first place? You bought into the fact that it was your grace that you gave. It is his grace it is his forgiveness, it is his hope, it is his love that we give to this broken and dying and depleted world, and it is not our job to watch over his word. It's his job. Oh, that's good preaching up in here today. He said he watches over his word to perform it. What does that mean? It means that when you release it from your life, it doesn't always leave your life, but you have someone else watching to make sure that everything that you sowed will come to pass in your future. I love it. If it grieves you when it leaves you, you made yourself the source instead of the resource. Grace wasn't yours to begin with. It came from him. And when you gave it, we don't get to determine what the response of the person should be. We grieve the Holy Spirit by taking ownership of the gifts that belong to him. I've done this before, but it applies. Can somebody, I need $100. I need somebody to give me $100 right now. You got it? Where was everybody else at? You, you guys aren't running up here? What's up with that? You just, you just, <laughs> you, you just happen to have 100 bucks. Can't hide money is what I always say. Just can't hide it. So he had 100 bucks right there. I just made a simple ask, and he had $100. Two crisp $50 bills. The reason why Pastor David was able to run up here as fast as he did and the reason why some of you are still sitting on your wallets is because you didn't know that I gave Pastor David that $100 before church today. <laughs> These two 50s belong to me. What's the point? Why did he give that so cheerfully? Why did he run so fast? Why didn't Charity grab his coattail and say, what are you doing? Because it wasn't his to begin with. He was holding on to it to give back to the one who had it in the first place. And in all of our lives, this is what God is saying to you. Be a cheerful giver, not just of money, but of hope and of love and of grace and of forgiveness. Because it doesn't belong to you in the first place. It came from the creator of life. Somebody say amen to that. What you have isn't yours. You are holding it until God gives you the instruction. I'm going to say that again. What you have is not yours. Your life is not your own. To him you belong. Our life is to make a giving, not a living. When we begin to give ourselves away, when we begin to say, God, I wake up today, and no matter what I have going on on my heart's agenda, I make room for whatever you want to do in my life. If you want me to give money, I'll give money. If you want me to give grace, I'll give grace. If you want me to sow forgiveness, I'll sow forgiveness. Because if I don't do those things, how can I be someone who receives them in my life? Are you with me today? What you have isn't yours. You're holding it until God gives you the instruction. We are called to be conduits. We are not called to be dead seas. We are called to be conduits. We are not called to be roadblocks. 
We are called to be a bridge. We are not called to be a dead end. Did you know that the definition of rebellion means to dam up or to block the flow? So whenever God gives something to us and he instructs us to move in faith to give it away, when we begin to hold back what God gave to us, that's called rebellion. And by the way, before we start casting stones at witchcraft, understand that 1 Samuel 15, 23 says that rebellion is as the sin as witchcraft. So before you go turning over tables on Bourbon Street in New Orleans, please understand that when we withhold something that God meant to go through us, we are just the same spiritually as a witch. That's what your Bible says. That's what your Bible says. Pastor, that's good preaching on a Sunday morning. Keep on preaching. Thank you, I will. After we deal with with selfishness and after we deal with grieving and after we deal with all of these things that God wants us to deal with in our hearts, then he can develop things inside of us. Number three, God wants to develop in us a generous heart. How many of you in this place say, Pastor, I want a generous heart in my life. I just, I, I want to be generous to everybody around me. I want people to know that I'm generous, uh, not to always ask me for something, but just to know that I'm obeying God in all categories of my life. Deuteronomy 15, it says, Thou shalt furnish, furnish him liberally, out of thy flock and out of thy floor. Remember, this is the same poor family, poor guy that is used in Deuteronomy 15. We're still talking about the same dynamic here. We're, we're still talking about how to give to someone in need. And we're talking about how to not do it and rely on our debts being canceled in the year of Jubilee. Deuteronomy 15, furnish or give freely out of your flock, out of your floor, out of your wine press. And, and out of wherewith the Lord God hath blessed you, give out of that blessing. Because we are born selfish, we are born again generous, we don't give to get, we give to give. Giving more than anything else in your Bible works out selfishness and greed out of our lives. What does Jesus say? Luke 6, 30 through 36. Are you ready? Shot, I'm ready. Give to every man that asks, and of him that takes away goods, Them not again. And as they would men ought to do, do likewise to them. And if you love them which love you, what reward is that? For sinners also love them that love themselves. And if you do good to them that do good to you, what reward do you have? For sinners also do the same. And if you lend to them with hope to receive, what reward do you have? For sinners also lend to sinners, and they receive much gain. But here it is. Here is the dichotomy between the world and the kingdom. Verse 35, but love your enemies. Do good. Lend, hoping for nothing again, and your reward shall be great and you shall be children of the highest. Oh, this will mess me up. For he is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. What did that say? Surely the King James spelt thankful wrong. No. God is kind to those who will never say thank you to him. He is kind to those who rebel against him. He is kind and loving towards those. And so Jesus makes the point in verse 36. So just as your father is kind unto the unthankful and just as your father loves his enemies and just as your father does good expecting nothing in return, verse 36, be therefore merciful for your father is merciful. When we begin to give and live our lives as a giving and not a living, we begin to take on the character of Christ and selfishness begins to be uprooted out of the garden of our heart. And we're able to then lead a life that says, God, whatever you want to plant here, this is good ground because I'm going to give from my life and nothing belongs to me. When we give without hope of receiving anything back, We are most like Jesus. 
The only caveat to this is we must be careful not to continually give to a broken system because, hear this, we are called to empower, not enable. I'm going to... I'm not going to fund someone's addiction that would lead to their demise. My assignment is to empower their future, which may mean saying no right now. Are you with me? So I'm not withholding a blessing. I'm actually preserving the blessing by saying no if they're not stewarding correct things in their life. It's not my job to judge it, but if it's a broken system, I can't keep giving to the cycle. We don't give We don't give to get, we give to give. So here's a heart check. When is the last time we asked God to give us something so that we could give it away? We're like, Father, we I I need you to move in my life. God, I need you, I need you to do this because my child needs this. I need you to do this because I need this. I need you to move this way because I need this canceled. I need you to do this because for my life, for my life, for my life, for my life. And God is saying, When's the last time that you ask me to give you something so that it could just flow right through you? When you begin to change your heart posture, your garden begins to be weeded out from the doubt and the worries and the cares and the concerns of this world. And you say, God, you have found in me a person where you can plant anything and I'll water it and I'll steward it. And then when it raises up into a harvest, I'll give it all away because nothing belongs to me. Are you in the room today? You can count the number of seeds in an apple, but you can't count the number of apples in a seed. Why? Because we are called to make a giving, not a living. Be- because, you, because you give, your giving will at last outlast your life. We're called to make a giving, not a living. Because all of us at some point in our journey are going to expire here in this world and we're going to live on forever in eternity somewhere. But when we give and sow into people's lives, that seed and that sowing and that giving outlast us being on this earth. We give to give. We don't give to get. The last thing that I want to give to you is to develop a grateful heart. Deuteronomy 15. You in the room today? Deuteronomy 15. And the Lord shall remember. Don't miss this. Is dealing with the heart of a nation. And Deuteronomy, by the way, is the most quoted Old Testament book in the New Testament. Jesus quotes it several times. And, and here we kind of get into the nitty gritty of, of where we need to be for our lives as believers when selfishness is in our gardens. He says, you shall remember When you used to be a slave in Egypt and the Lord redeemed you, in other words, he purchased you, he bought you back, therefore I command this thing today. And so he was speaking to the nation and the nation was offering up excuses and they were saying, yeah, but yeah, but I don't want to give to that person, and I don't want to do that, and I don't want to do this, and I don't want to, I don't want to be the person to continually pull someone out of a ditch. And God was saying, no, remember where you were when I found you. Remembrance sometimes is the greatest cleaner of a hardened heart. Remembrance sometimes can be the very thing that takes out all the weeds that are choking out the seeds of your life. Remember when you were a slave in Egypt. I want you to remember right now when you were a slave in your sin, when you were a slave in darkness, when you were bound to sin and fear and, 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 and torment and turmoil in your life and all of a sudden someone came with the keys of death, hell and the grave and you didn't do anything to deserve it or earn it. It was free by the blood-stained banner of Jesus Christ. And he said, you once were slave to sin, but now I make you the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So because I've done it to you, do this unto others. Set people free. Let people off the hook. Forgive them. Love them. Bless them. Sow into them. Not expecting anything in return. Knowing that your heavenly father sees and takes record of everything that you do. Remember. Somebody say remember. Remember. Remember that everything came from God. 
everything goes back to God. Remember that he showed grace to you, so show grace to others. Remember that he forgave you, so forgive others. Whatever you do, don't forget to remember. Remembrance has the ability to clean out your heart's garden. Worship team, come on up here. I got one more verse, and then we're going to get you guys out of here after communion on this Sunday. Beautiful Sunday morning. Hosea chapter 6. Pastor Josh, you talked about our heart. You talked about our lives. You talked about the seeds. You talked about the soil. You talked about the weeds. But what is God's heart for my life? Hosea 6, verse number 6. This is the heart of God. God says, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. I desire the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. What is God saying? Whenever you sow mercy, you are most like your heavenly father. Whenever you sow grace, you are most like your heavenly father. Whenever you give without any expectation of someone giving back to you, you are most like your father. God is not after sacrifice. God is after obedience. Obedience is better than sacrifice. So I'm going to ask you to do something that I've never asked you to do before. I'm going to ask you sitting right where you are to take an inventory of your heart. David did this. He said, Lord, forgive me of the hidden sin that lies deep within the crevices and the confines of my heart that nobody sees, but if you see it, reveal it to me. Show it to me. That same David was the recipient of a prophet coming by his home and everyone was looking at the outward appearances. But God said through the prophet, I look at the heart. I'm not here to look at what's on the outside. I'm here to look at what's on the inside. I'm going to ask you today, take an inventory of your garden. Take an inventory of your life. Obedience is better than sacrifice. What has God asked you to do that you still haven't done? Delayed obedience is disobedience. God may be asking you to call somebody and forgive them. He may be asking you to send a text to someone and show them mercy. God may be asking you to have a hard conversation with a family member and then bless them financially. But whatever it is, I know that God's going to speak to your heart. He's reminding you right now of previous conversations. I'm convinced one thing as a church, that at times the prayers of the saints are hindered because they fail to obey God in the last instruction that he gave them. And so we go back to the Garden of Eden and we try to hide from a God that's impossible to hide from. And God is just saying, no, I just want you to do the hard thing. Have the hard conversation. Forgive and love and show grace. And when you give mercy, you're most like me, your heavenly father. I want you to take an inventory of your life as I'm talking. There might be another person in this room today that you just need to make things right with. Whatever it is, I wanted to start out this message with the hard conversations first so that by Easter, God can clean out all of our gardens and we can help those guests coming into this place who are living in darkness transition from darkness into light through Jesus Christ. Everybody standing all across this room, God wants you to know his heart today more than he wants what's in your hand. What's in your hand will expire. What's in your heart, when given, can last for generations. God may be challenging you to do something that you've never done before in this place. But here today, my last challenge for you is this. Don't forget to remember. Scripture says, you shall 
remember that you used to be a slave in the land of Egypt and the Lord God redeems you. Therefore, I command you, think on this thing today. Every head bowed and every eye closed all across this great sanctuary, the greatest church in the world here at Gulf Coast on this Sunday morning. You're in this room today and you say, Pastor, I've forgotten all that God's done in my life. I'm away from God right now and I want to accept him. I want to re-accept him as my Savior and my Lord. I've not followed him the way that I should and my garden is now infested with weeds and parasites and all kinds of things that are choking out the seed. And so today, spiritually, I'm going to ask God to clean up my garden again. If you're in this room today and you say, Pastor, I just want to accept Jesus in my life. I veered away from him. And today is my day to clean up my garden. On the count of three, I want you to raise your hand and I'm going to pray for you. I want to pray for the Lord to come in and be the God of your garden. Are you ready? One, two, three. Any hand raised? Thank you so much. Thank you for those hands. Sirs in the middle lady and ladies in the, on the sides and even some in the balcony thank you so much for your obedience to the Lord today obedience is better than sacrifice today is the day of salvation and now is the acceptable time to receive the Lord there are others in this room today that you've been redeemed by the blood of Jesus you remember what it was like to be in darkness your assignment is just to pray in this moment. As many pray the greatest prayer that they'll ever pray in their life. And that is for God to come in and do like he did in the Bible, which he reversed the curse of Eden and resurrected from the garden tomb so that he can live in the garden of our heart forever. You're in this room today. I want you to pray this prayer after me. Meet it with all of your heart. The Bible says in Romans 10, 9 and 10 that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, you believe in your heart, in your garden, that God raised him from the dead, that you would be saved. For with the heart man believes, but with the mouth confession is made. There is a string between what you say and what you believe. And today, we're going to open the door to our garden and invite the Holy Spirit to come and change us. Repeat this after me, if you would. Heavenly Father, repeat it like you mean it. Heavenly Father, we're here today. Our garden is open. My heart is ready. I believe, I believe in my heart that God raised Jesus from the dead I confess my sin. I confess my thoughts. I confess my darkness. Forgive me. Cleanse me. Change my garden from the inside out. I'll live for you all the days of my life as a giving, not a living. Jesus' name. Come on, let's rejoice at those that prayed that prayer this morning. Thank you so much. If you prayed that prayer today, I want you to come and find one of our prayer partners along the front of this church today. And uh, Pastor David is coming. Come on up at this juncture. I, I want us to do something before we all come into the altar today. Instead of doing that, I want to begin to worship right where you are. I want you to turn your seat into an altar because I believe the Holy Spirit is going to move along these rows today. I don't normally do this, but I believe he's going to move along these rows today. Just like some of our gardens, there's rows and there's seeds that are planted in sequence. Somebody on your row needs to hear you praise God for where you've been. 
Somebody on your road needs to hear you say, God, I remember when I was in darkness and you brought me out into the marvelous light. I remember when you healed my body. I remember when you set me free. Somebody on your road needs to hear that today. I remember. I remember. I remember what it was like. I remember. Before we take communion, I want us to worship together. Come on, let somebody around you hear your worship today from your garden that's without weeds, full of seeds of faith. In Jesus' name, come on, let's worship church.